dedicated to the strength of the nation. From Hollywood, your theater of stars. Proudly, we hail. Now, here is your host, the well known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your Theater of Stars, where each week the cinema world's finest motion picture talent gathers for your weekly entertainment. Ruth Huzzy is our Proudly We Hail star in a great dramatic story titled, All the King's Horses. Ruth portrays Mary Barnes, the wife of a hard-working but unlucky young man. They become the parents of a lovable adopted child. Then, adversity strikes. Cliff, Mary's husband, loses his job. And because of this, they must give up their little son, Biff. Here is tragedy, stark realism, and deep mother love. One completely lives the conflicting mental processes portrayed by Ruth Huzzy. And now act one of All the King's Horses, starring Ruth Huzzy. Mary Barnes, her husband Cliff, and their young son enjoyed living in the little white cottage on the outskirts of town. There were the tall elm trees, nodding at the slightest whisper of a breeze, faithful sentries against the, the day. And there were hollyhocks and daffodils and a climbing rose bush, which, when in bloom, delivered its unforgettable fragrance. In front, the cool green lawn spread down from the house, giving away only to the pond, with a splendid oak tree at the border. Under the oak tree, late in the afternoon when her work was finished, Mary would sometimes sit beside the youngster a book of nursery rhymes between them. And so we find them the day our story begins. Mother? Yes, dear? Open the book and tell me my favorite story. Which one do you mean, dear? The one where you make up the story with the rhymes out of the book. Oh, but you've heard the story so often, sweetheart. Don't you ever get tired of hearing it? Nope. Please tell it again, Mother. All right, darling, if you like. Once upon a time, there dwelled in a beautiful forest a prince and a princess. They lived in a great white castle with a lake that spread out before it. Was the lake just like ours? Oh, my lord, a king size. Well, they were perfectly happy, these two, for the prince was as handsome as handsome could be. And the princess, well, she wasn't so bad herself. And the prince and the princess had a beautiful little son. And his name was Biff. I always liked it when you say his name was Biff. You do, huh? Uh-huh, but that's my name. But that's a very good name for a little prince. Prince Biff? What's wrong with it? Well, I suppose it's all right. But go on with the story, Mother. Well, now, they weren't always this happy, the prince and princess. But when they had first arrived at their kingdom, and long before the angels had sent them Prince Biff, the word began to spread of a huge dragon threatening everything. Oh, yes, he was a terrible dragon, and he proclaimed trouble for everyone. Well, at that time, the prince and the princess were living in a less conspicuous castle. And one night, the princess was cooking his dinner when the prince returned home, preceded as always by quite a considerable fanfare of trumpets. Oh, quite a considerable fanfare indeed. Hello, darling. Well, Claire. How about turning around from the stove and giving your very weary husband a kiss? I'd be happy to. Gee, I love you. Hey, does that Kennedy next door have to play that radio so loud? Kennedy! Kennedy, you're blasting us out of the building! A little better. Our neighbors wear their music so loud, don't they? Don't they? <laughs> ah, but come here to me, you. My lovely princess. Oh, well, darling. I'm sorry you're tired. Oh, it was a rugged day in more respects than one. Just before closing time, a customer came in. 
Made me drag out every shoe in the store. Had them stacked around me knee deep. You know what she says to me? Oh, do tell me what she says to you. She says, oh, I was just looking. Could you direct me to household appliances? I could have crowned her with the size seven. She wore a nine foot. Oh, you poor dear. And that's, uh, that's just part of it. Business is slow. Drangfield says if business doesn't improve, they're going to have to cut down. Oh? Yeah. You know where that puts me. Newest man in the department. Well, anyway, you wash up now, and I'll dish up dinner. Okay. Well, where are my slippers? They're in the hall closet where they belong. Oh, and bring my store. I'll need it if we sit out after dinner. <laughs> Sing the song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye, four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. When the pie was opened, the birds began to sing. What had a dainty dish to set before a king? Is that what the prince had for dinner? It could be. Oh, I'd have taken popsicles. But wasn't the prince pretty excited about the dragon? Oh, yes. The dragon was beginning to crawl right out into the open, threatening doom in more ways than one. Couldn't the prince something about it? Couldn't he but him over the feet with a baseball bat like mine? I don't think he had a baseball bat. Anyway, after they had dinner that night, they went out to sit on their balcony, watching the lights of the countryside. You know, I like this fire escape. I'm glad. And you know, I can always tell when it's Monday. How? I can see the Empire State Building right over the top of Officer Murphy's night shirt. Oh, you. <laughs> hey. What? You. Me? Yes, you. Did. did you see the doctor today, like you said you were going to? Uh-huh. What did he say, now? Well, he, uh, he said he's afraid not. No? You mean that we can't? No, Cliff, I guess not. Not, not ever. Oh. But, Cliff, w- when I was coming home on the subway, I, I got to thinking about something. What? We can still have our babies. They're adopting them every day. I bet we could find just the one we want. Well, I don't know. We'll have to think about it. Oh, but, Cliff, if we're ever going to have a baby, I mean... Well, we could take our time, look carefully. It might even be better than having one of our own. We wouldn't know what our own would be like unless until it got here in this way. Well, well, we could tell beforehand. Well, do you know any place to go, Mary? I called the orphanage out at Englewood. They have a lot of babies. Couldn't you just take a little time off tomorrow and go with me? Oh, no, no, I, I couldn't do that. Not with things the way they are at the store, I wouldn't dare. Oh, of course. Oh, but say, the day after tomorrow is Sunday. That's right. Well, maybe they stay open for people like us. Well, they must. Oh, darling, I... Oh, I just, I just can't wait till Sunday. One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four, shut the door. Five, six, pick up sticks. Seven, eight, lay them straight. Nine, ten, a big fat hen. That's what that old dragon was by now, wasn't he? A big fat hen. Well, almost. They had him on the run. The prince buckled on his armor, grabbed his longest spear, saddled up his white charger, and with the princess riding beside him, set off to do away with the dragon once and for all. Yes, indeed. Once and for all. This supposed to be the place, Mary? I guess so. That's what it says on the door. Well, then, where is somebody? And where do they keep the babies? There's a sign on the desk there, Claire. Oh, yeah. Ring bell for attendance. Guess I better ring it, huh? Mm-hmm. I wonder if they've got any with red hair and blue eyes. You suppose so, Mary? Oh, but that's silly, Cliff. Now, neither you nor I have red hair and blue eyes. You know it wouldn't just match. Well, does it have to match? I mean, can't babies be a color scheme like... like well, you know. And besides, if he has red hair, he'll have spunk. Maybe he'll be able to lick some of the kids when he grows up and go to school, maybe. Clifford Barnes, if you think we're going to raise our baby to be a prize fighter, you can just think again. I won't have him coming home from school with his clothes all torn and black eyes. Well, he's got to defend himself, hasn't he? He can't let himself be walked all is over. Is there something I can do for you, please? What? I said, is there something I can do for you? Oh, is there... Yes. Uh, are you the manager? Well, I'm the supervisor of the institution. My name is Miss Peterson. Oh. Well, uh, we'd like to look at some babies. Some with red hair and blue eyes. We don't either. We'd prefer something in brownish hair, more like ours. Well, I'm afraid I don't quite understand. We want to adopt a baby, a boy baby. Oh, I see. 
One that's intelligent and has a good disposition. And housebroke. Well, I don't seem to recall having received an application from you. Now, what is your name, please? Barnes. Mr. and Mrs. Clifford Barnes. Uh, what do you mean, application? We just want to adopt a baby. <laughs> well, I'm afraid you have the wrong impression about adoption, Mr. Barnes. You see, it's quite necessary to make a formal application and have our investigators check your qualifications, your ability to raise a baby, and to take care of it, your financial responsibility. That sounds like a lot of stuff to go through. Well, when all it means is an extra quarter milk a day and maybe a couple of dozen of those, those three-corner doodads. Now, if you people would care to come into my office, I'll be glad to explain the whole thing to you and give you an application form. Oh, yes, thank you. We'd like to do that. Well, yes, yes, I guess we would. But I didn't realize there was such a routine to go through. Quiet, darling. These babies are very particular with whom they associate. And so that's where they found young Prince Biff, out in the forest under a cabbage leaf. What, what about the dragon? Is he a big prince conquering yet? Not yet. He seemed to have disappeared. Both the prince and the princess had every reason to believe that the dragon was all washed up. Yes, all washed up. Don't wake him. Brother, is he a rugged little cookie? Oh, he's beautiful. Well, you should see him whip that rattle up around. He's going to be a ball player. Well, don't bring home any baseballs. Not yet. You uh, like the name, Biff? Yes, yes, I like it. Come now, let's close the door. Oh, Cliff. I'm so happy with our baby. I know you are. Our baby, Cliff. I still can't believe it. I can't either. It's almost like, like everything's the beginning again. The starting anew. <laughs> in, uh, in one respect, it certainly has worked out that way. Well, what is it, Cliff? I don't mean to concern you. You know I didn't like my job. Oh, Cliff. Mr. Angfield gave me my walking papers today. Oh, Cliff, no. No, no, no. Don't be alarmed. I'll find something else. Something I'll like much better. I know I will. Well, you've got to, Cliff. They won't let us keep this if you don't. You, you've just got to. The curtain falls in Act One of All the King's Horses, starring Ruth Huzzy. rises on act two of our starring Ruth Huzzy as Mary Boss. We're back sitting by the pond, our three rhymes open on her lap. Oh, that old dragon. Yes, indeed. He was getting part Had to be done away with. Oh, he had to be done away with. Oh, he's fine, dear. Nope. I've been tramping until I'm blue in the face. There isn't a job to be had in this town. My oh, darling, what are we going to do? They'll take him away from us. They please. can't take him away from us, Mary. But Cliff, our year's probation's up tomorrow, and we have to go and see the judge. If we haven't any income, you you know what Miss Peterson said. That woman. I know what she said, but they're not going to take him away from us. They can't. Cliff, I'm afraid. I, I'd just die if they did. Don't worry, darling. Is there something we could have for lunch? I've got to get out again and see what I can find. I spent a dollar this morning for food for the baby. We've only two dollars left. Well, I'm not awfully hungry anyway. I'm going out again, darling. I'll see you tonight. Old Mother Hubbard hasn't anything on us, has she? Old Mother Hubbard, she went to the cupboard to fetch her poor dog a bone. And when she got there, the cupboard was there. And so her poor dog had none. And you and the princess had nothing to eat? Well, almost nothing. But they didn't lose heart. They kept trying to find a way to trap the dragon and destroy him. For now it meant so much to them because the little boy prince they found under the cabbage leaf was growing up. Oh, they didn't lose her. Won't you sit down, Mrs. Bond? Thank you. Here are the papers, Judge Adams. Oh, yes, yes. Well, your husband didn't come down with you? No, he, he was unable to get down. Well, uh, now let's see. You're still at the same address? Yes, we are. Age, husband's age, mm-hmm. Oh, you evidently forgot to fill in this income bracket. I'll fill it in for you. 
What is your income, Mrs. Barnes? Our income? Yes. Oh, well, uh, that's what I wanted to tell you about. You see, Judge, at the moment, well, we haven't any income. My husband lost his job about a month ago, but he expects to have another one right away. That's why he didn't come down today. By right away, how soon do you mean, Mrs. Barnes? Well, I... Does your husband have a job in mind, one that's promised? Well, no, sir, he hasn't, but... Well, I'm, I'm sure he'll be able to find something right away. I... Mrs. Barnes. Yes, sir. Miss Peterson must have told you. A prime requisite of adoption is that you must have an income sufficient to support the adopted baby. And you state you have no income. Now, have you any definite idea as to when you will have an income? Well, I know, Your Honor, but... The law dictates my course of action, Mrs. Barnes. And I have no alternative but to refuse the adoption. You mean take the baby away from us? That's what I mean. You can't do that. My husband will find a job. His sort of people don't stay out of jobs very long. That isn't the question, Mrs. Barnes. Well, the question is that you want to take our baby merely because at the moment my husband's out of a job. Like it was a repossession of some sort. Like we couldn't pay for the radio or refrigerator or automobile. But you can't repossess a baby for failure to make payment. He isn't just a piece of furniture. I'm sorry, Mrs. You're Barnes. sorry. Do you think being sorry means anything to us? Do you think your being sorry would take the place of a baby of flesh and blood that we've had with us for a year, that we've raised just like he was our own? And what if he was our own? You, you couldn't take him away from us just because my husband was out of a job, could you? Well, he is our own, just as much as if we'd been born to us. Well, we couldn't love him any more than we do. May I remind you that you're talking to a judge, and that what I'm doing happens to be the law. And may I remind you that you're talking to a mother, and the law I'm talking about should darn sight deeper than... And that any bunch of stuffed shirts can get together and think up. It's a law that says my husband and I love our baby, and he loves us. We're the only parents he's ever known. And you know nobody else has the right to take him away from us. God, give us a chance to show you. Please give us a chance. Well, the best I can do is this. I'll give you an extension of one week. <laughs> Mary, Mary. Please. But I don't want to shoot you. I've got the greatest, the most glorious news in the world. But please. You remember me telling you about Uncle Bert that lives in Virginia? Well, I just got this telegram. He's sending us $30,000 because he says he doesn't believe in waiting until he's dead to have his will probated. He's doing it now. Imagine, Mary, $30,000. The court can never take this. Oh, that's wonderful, darling, but not so loud, please. The baby's been sick all day. He's running the temperature. I've been waiting for you to come home. So temperature? We... Well, that's the case. We better call a doctor. Temperatures can be dangerous. We go see this now, Doctor. Yes, Mr. Barnes, but before you go in, I'd better warn you. Well, he, he, he isn't worse. No, Mrs. Barnes, not worse. Oh, thank heaven for that. Please. I hate to be the one who has to inform you. Your little boy has passed away. Oh, no. Doctor. No. No. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great bow. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. He was like Humpty Dumpty, Mother. Why, dear? Well, when you get to this part of the story, you always cry. Maybe you just tell it so good it's kind of get you. Maybe so. Don't tell it so good next time. Well, with Humpty Dumpty gone, what did the prince decide to do about the dragon man? Well, the prince almost gave up on that dragon he did. It was a very critical time in the kingdom. The prince was just about ready to turn everything over to the dragon. Just about ready. Claire? What? Say if it's three o'clock, you've got to get some rest. I can't sleep. I just can't sleep. Oh, but Cliff. The court it's... wanted to take him away from us. And we licked that almost like a miracle. Only to have... Oh, Mary. Please, please. Yesterday, he asked me for a Shetland pony. I couldn't buy him a picture of one. Today, I could buy him a dozen. Mary, we got to get out of here. You're right, Cliff. And that's when they dared the dragon of the forest 
and moved into their new white castle with the pond in front. And that turned out to be the beginning of the end of Mr. Dragon. Good. This part I really enjoyed. The beginning of the end. Well, Miss Peterson. Hello, Mrs. Barnes. Oh, it's come in. Oh, thank you. Who is it, dear? It's Miss Peterson from the nursery. Well, what brings you down our way, Miss Peterson? Well, I've been so busy, I haven't even had a chance to call you folks. I was very sorry to learn of your trouble. Well, that's very kind of you, Miss Peterson. I brought someone down with me I thought you might like to see. Oh? He's, uh, well, he's out in the car. Well, bring him in. And now, wait a minute. If it's a baby, no thanks. I don't want to go through that again. Well, Cliff, maybe we could just look at him. He has curly hair and two of the most beautiful dimples. Oh, please, Cliff. And a lovely disposition. What do you think? Well. Oh, go get him, Miss Peterson. <laughs> oh, <laughs> He's adorable, Miss Peterson. Don't you think so, Cliff? Oh, he's a noisy little character. Wow, look at him swing that arm around, just like, like this used to. Oh, here, you hold him, Mrs. Bond. Oh, may I? Of course. Well, he seems to like you. Who wouldn't? Almost seems as if he belongs. Oh, oh do you think he does, Cliff, does he? Oh, well, I guess he does, honey. Huh? I guess our new son does. So that was the end of Mr. Dragon, scourge of the forest, demon of the woods. Never more did he see the light of day. And the prince and the princess and young Prince Biff lived happily ever after. You didn't tell me how the prince killed the dragon. Oh, I can't tell you now. Here comes your father up the path. Oh, but you must. You always surprise me with the ending. Well, well, I'll tell you then. The, the prince got out a giant mirror and placed it before the dragon. And when the dragon looked into it, he dropped dead of disappointment. Oh, <laughs> that was terrific, brother. Oh. Thank you, Father. Hello, sweetheart. Hiya, Biff. Hey, Dad, let me tell you what happened to the dragon this time. Oh. Falls in the final act of All the King's Horses, starring Ruth Hussey. Congratulations to you, Ruth, on a splendid and capable performance. I thank you, too, for your generous contribution of time and talent on this Armed Forces Radio Service program. Be sure to join us next week for your Theater of Stars. And until then, this is C.P. McGregor saying thanks for listening, and cheerio from Hollywood. <laughs> We hail is a presentation of United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.